also talking and remembering what uh, the Trump administration is trying to do, basically liquidate the United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian refugees. That was set up specifically to attend to the Palestinians who were expelled from their land in 1948. So that, that, that meeting at the border was quite interesting because it was children coming from one refugee camp in the West Bank, and another set of children coming from the Shatila camp. That is the subject of our discussion today from Lebanon. And meeting at the border in 2000, the year 2000, uh, in the south of Lebanon. But we will be showing it next week, so we decided not to show it tonight, which usually is in this class, students who have taken the class before, and next week, a whole bunch of alumni, and it was just thrown back. Uh, we actually, we show it all the time around this period, but we thought since it's going to be shown next week, we do not need to be showing it today. Instead, we're going to show another film, which I have never seen. It's called Waltz with, uh, Waltz with Bashir, and it's an animated film that made by an Israeli who was actually part of the Israeli soldiers in 1982. And I'm not going to say some more, so we will all watch it and we will have a discussion about it. Uh, we are also want to announce two other things that are happening next week, next Tuesday, in the, uh, in the uh, Sigma RLS 655, which is Comparative Border Service Palestine and Mexico. We are going to be having a film called Symbols of Resistance about the Chicana, Chicana movement. And it's going to actually be shown, I think, for the first time at San Francisco State. And the director of the film is going to be with us. It's going to be coming with us. We're going to show the film. And we're going to have discussion about what that means and how do we think about it. Thank you. And uh, on uh, Tuesday, we are actually quite honored that a number of the strikers from 1968 contacted us and said they would like to do an event in supporting the strike, the 1968 strike, but also in support of Ahmed Sabiz. So we're going to be meeting here in this room, and both of us, by the way, in this room, uh, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. The first event is going to be on Tuesday at 4 p.m. The second event is on Wednesday, October 10th, at 7 p.m. here. And we are going to have a number of strikers who are going to be speaking about their experience and talk about what this means for us today, since we are building and organizing this manner in the spirit of 68. So it's actually quite relevant. And on the 8th, as I mentioned, there's going to be the, uh, the ha, here he is. Here he is. Hello. Okay. So we should be coming back <laughs> And uh, um, I just announced it in the festival. So next week. And then uh, on uh, the 9th, the 9th? of October, which is a Tuesday, at 4 p.m., we are actually going to have a discussion in the Comparative Border Studies class about histories of fascism. And we're going to have a, a professor joining us who will discuss the whole history of 1936-39 Spanish Civil War, what's going on with the Catalonia movement, what's going on with the Basque movement, what's going on with the history of Spain and Franco, and comparing what does that mean in 1936-39 Palestinian history, the Palestinian revolution of 1936-39, and what happened in the US at the time. So we're going to be looking at, again, comparatively as we always do. So please join us for all these events. Everything is going to be posted on your classes, on your classroom, as you know. All these events are opportunities. In your class, it's not an opportunity to gain credit for an event, because it's your class. You have to go to it anyway. But if it is the other class, you can actually count it as an event. So you only you need to do event, attend one, but you are welcome to attend everything. So now what I, before we actually see the film, then we're going to have two things. First of all, we are, we're going to have, we're honored to have uh, our brother, our comrade, and Tony Gonzalez, who was actually, went to Lebanon and met with the Palestinians. He's going to be speaking about that. And he's a, a leader of the American Indian movement. I've already mentioned the film festival in, in uh, uh, next week, uh, October 8th, at Eric Casada, and, as well as the Roxy Theater. And he can speak about that. And then we're going to have uh, Jamal Darjani, who's a professor who's teaching two courses here at Ahmed Studies, and also as an award-winning journalist. Some of you are the students in this class. Who is going to be, he has just returned in early September from Palestine. And he is a, 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 an indigenous person from Jerusalem. So he's going to be giving us a short presentation. Each one is going to be speaking for 10 minutes. 
short presentations. We're going to see the film, which is 90 minutes, post with Bashir, and then we're going to be opening up, and I will move into that then. So without further ado, I forgot to bring the sage from Palestine, but I will bring it next week to share with you. Okay, so without further ado, I turn it over to you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Oh, I think greetings my relatives. I brought some sage. Some of you know about sage, and this is California sage, and it's to bless ourselves. And uh, we offer this so we can all be of one mind, you know, as we as we as we uh, breathe the, the sage. And uh, we always like to think that the spirits uh, like the, like the sage as well. So I'll pass this around. See if anybody wants to just smudge yourself down. And as a professor mentioned that, yes, indeed, I was in, uh, in, in Beirut, in Lebanon, with the PLO. And uh, I had the great pleasure, the honor, of uh, being there for one month with uh, uh, Yasser Arafat and, and uh, Al Fatah people. And I had the great honor of meeting his brother, uh, who was the head of the Red Crescent uh, society at that time. I'm talking about March 1980. Mm. And uh, well, first of all, with the sage going around, if it goes out, please light it, keep it going. I just put a little bit out. If it bothers you, you know, just let me know as well. But uh, with the sage going on, and uh, I'd like to ask everybody to stand up. I want to sing a song. And the song is, is uh, in the ancient Lakota Sioux uh, language, and uh, uh, it says, uh, Grandfather, have pity on me. I want to live. Have pity on me. I want my people to live. Waka toka u warite Waka tonka u warite 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 Waka tonka u warite Way o Waka tonka u si mala le well, we hey, well, we hey, Waka Tonka, oh, one he day. Well, we hey, Waka Tonka, oh, one he day. Waka Tonka, oh, one he day. One he day. One he day. Waka tonka o wani te we we Waka tonka o si mala ye we we he we we he Waka tonka o wani te we we Oh thank you my relatives now, sing that song so we can all be strong and always keep Palestine in mind and never lose hope that one day we will all go home to our peoples, to our lands, and be buried there for as long as our ancestors have been there. We will be there too. So we struggle for you, with you. American Indian Movement, worldwide, we tell the world that the Palestinians are the Indians. Uh, they're the Palestinians of the Indians of the land. And we are the Palestinians here in North America. And we are being sought after and as we've witnessed many of the massacres that have occurred and what we talk about tonight. And the massacres that have occurred in our lands here. And our struggle is the same. It's for the land. And uh, we all know that the United Nations last year 
have rejected the report that indeed they found that the Israeli government is an apartheid government. Same, same South Africa, all the characteristics. And the people there were threatened. And that report got, got uh, deep sixed. It never reached the tables, it never reached discussion. They know the threat. The facts are there for themselves. The colonial period that established the Israeli state goes back to even the, the plundering that went, began in the 19th century. As we are affected here, and particularly in California, with the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, the United States government pushed from the east to the west with that doctrine, manifest destiny, that God ordained, God ordained the move westward. So we can't deny we are in a holy war. We've been at war since 1492. We've been struggling as long. We say that's when the First World War happened. It wasn't in 1914 or 1916. The First World War was here in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere. And the whole European theater was out here trying to carve up a piece of territory. They were fighting each other. Wars were going on, both in their, in their homelands and on the high seas and even here on the ground in the hemisphere. So much so that even the Pope, the Catholic Church, got involved as the facilitator to bring peace and help the demarcation of the territory. And that very same pope issued what we refer to today as papal bulls, these doctrines that emanate from the church, from the pope. And among those doctrines was the doctrine of discovery. Colonial governments continue to want to justify their conquests, their invasions. They want to romanticize once they're here. You know the characteristics. And as they moved westward, they refined the art, the gunpowder, the skill of killing. When they reached California, it was wholesale manslaughter here in California. I mean, the government of California at that early time was issuing money for scalps and breasts of Indian men, women, and children. And our peoples have survived just as Palestine will survive and has survived. Yes, I, I, I was with Yasser Arafat and, and the Piano. It was great moments for me. I was uh, about 31 years old and I was in Vietnam. I was drafted into the war right after high school at 18, May 68. I graduated in June 67. By January of 68, I had received my, my conscription, my notice to be drafted. And I, I was in the infantry. In fact, I, I was so brainwashed, I was kicked up to advanced infantry training. The art of killing. And so I do consider myself a war criminal. 
and uh, I was wounded there twice. And it, it was after the second time that I was wounded, I had a hole in my leg that I had a serious talk with Jesus Christ because at that time I was a Catholic too. I, I mean, I had layers and layers of, of colonization on me. And you will learn that and you will peel it off as you age. You know, that we, we, we have all these layers we have to peel off to find ourselves. And in that process, I found myself when I had a talk with Jesus Christ that I think I'm on the wrong side. What happened to thou shalt not kill? All these trainees that I had got. But I was cannon fodder and I was trained for it because even in junior high school, in high school, as we have today in public schools, I was in the ROTC. I was training as a cadet. I was 14, 15 years old in junior high school carrying an M14. This country's got problems. It's the most violent country in the world, the biggest gun dealer. $700 billion a year in the defense, in the military, $700 billion. You, you combine even the, the, the military budget of, of Britain, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and two or three other countries, you combine their military budget, it doesn't even come close to the United States. The United States has over 100, it has 1,000 military bases throughout the world. For every dollar in your pocket, 50 cents of that dollar goes into the military. It's the biggest polluter in the world. Yes, I, you know, by the time I got to Palestine, when I got to Lebanon, I, I was studying revolutions. I knew I had to change my ways. And I became, I went back to my roots I relinquished the Catholicism and all these other religions that were imposed on me. And I went back to my people, my way of prayer, natural way, ancient beliefs, traditional knowledge, native intelligentsia that we all had. Hundreds if not thousands of years ago, we all had that native intelligentsia. And so as we learn to survive in this conflicting world, you know, you have to always be looking for solutions. Looking for solutions, and that's hard. To be a visionary for your people. And uh, there's a process to our development. But we like to say that after you're 40 years old, you can't be making mistakes like you had been making mistakes before. So you got till 40 to be making <laughs> mistakes, trial and error. But thereafter, you know, you need to find your strength and walk tall. And uh, I like to say, when you wake up in the morning after what I've gone through, I'm 70 years old now. But I like to wake up thinking like a buffalo. Have the buffalo attitude. And that buffalo attitude is you ride into the storm. Ride into the storm so you can get to the other side where there's calm and peace. So with that, I want to thank you, my relatives. It's really an honor to be talking to you. And we want to share our bond, our struggle together. I encourage you, as the professor said, to our film festival. I'll pass some of these around. Can I pass some of these around? Maybe we can keep a couple of them so we can put them around. Yeah, and I brought some, some of these cards here as well. So please come to our film festival. That's Monday, October 8th. That's also declared now in San Francisco Indigenous People's Day. It took a long time coming, right? Berkeley passed that resolution 1992. So don't, let's not think that San Francisco is a liberal, progressive, <laughs> open town, you know. It's really a bubble and, and uh, there's a lot of lies to that. All right, thank you, my relative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony actually, as I mentioned before, invited us to show two films 
in the afternoon on Palestine, so part of the indigenous film festival is going to be two films on Palestine. And then in the evening, I think it's really important to note that there will be the film Warrior Women about Madonna Thunderhawk and the Standing Rock Woman is going to be shown in the evening. And Madonna and her daughter will be here as well as the filmmaker in San Francisco. That's a huge treat. That's such an honor. So be sure, and also you can get, if you write your report about that, it will be part of your class. Uh, so I want to thank you. Yes, Professor. I'm going to pass this around, and I hope I get it back, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's a picture of me with Yasser Arafat, and uh, I cherish it. Maybe you it. shouldn't pass it around. Maybe we should just take a picture and send it to the students in the class. Okay. <laughs> so, Sorry. Nothing will happen. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank are you. you. Are you going to leave, Tony? No, no. Okay, you're staying. Yeah. yeah. So you can like stay. Uh, so question. okay. So with uh, the, the next uh, on our agenda is uh, Professor Jamal Dajani, who is teaching two courses this semester: the RRS 255, which is Civil Liberties of Arabs and Muslims, post 9/11/2001, and RRS 430, which is Arab Media Images. And Professor Jamal is an award-winning journalist. I know. He has a radio show on Thursdays at 2 p.m. on KBOO, which is the only black radio station in the Bay Area. It's not an accident. You can see a button here that the American Indian Movement includes Palestine in the Indigenous Film Festival. And the Arab Talk Radio is hosted on the only black station in San Francisco. And we will continue having this discussion. I'm just signaling them. So I'm going to turn it to Jamal so he will give us a report about having just returned from Palestine uh, three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. And Jamal is a resident of Jerusalem. He's a Jerusalemite. Him, his family, and his grandparents. Family goes way back. And he's going to be giving us a report about his trip and this is just a small report, but there will be others that will be happening throughout the semester. So, Jamal. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jerusalem. I mean, the subject of Palestine, this is a long topic. But also, of course, when we talk about Sabra and Shatila, which is one of the major massacres and injustice that has been done to Palestinians. Of course, our history is riddled with these incidents and massacres from Dar Yassin and, and others. And we tend sometimes to forget about Jerusalem. So when we talk about Palestine, Jerusalem, Palestine is the body and Jerusalem is the heart for every Palestinian. And uh, I call this, let me see what's happened here. Okay, good. No? Why is it not here? Okay. So I call this the Battle of Jer uh, for Jerusalem. And I don't want you to think about the Battle of for Jerusalem. We're not talking about the physical battle, the military battle. It's a, ma it's a multi faceted uh, battle uh, to erase the identity, the Palestinian identity. Uh, you know, and the both historical, religious, emotional identity to Jerusalem. And I wanted to bring some pictures because I want to start with this picture because this picture people don't see it quite a bit. Uh, can anyone tell me what's this picture of? I mean, well, I mean, you see the Dome of the Rock, the uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. But this area, actually, it's, it's very famous now because everybody sees this picture and they see the big plaza, which is the Wailing Wall. And it's an empty, so you see a huge plaza representing the Wailing, wailing Wall. You don't see any picture, any buildings uh, in the pictures that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. So for the average person, you know, people think that this that Palestinians didn't exist. And, and, and this is why I like to start with this picture, because this is a really, what, what's wrong with this one here? <laughs> this is San Francisco State equipment. <laughs> I, have to, I have to hold the wire, I guess. <laughs> but basically, in 1960, and we'll move to the next one, okay? okay. Hold on. Let me 
Okay, so this is the picture that you see when I can't keep this thing on. Not gonna come near it. So this is the picture. So I'll think about the picture from before and the picture today. And, and then look at the bottom here of the screen and you see the destruction and the removal of both uh, Arab and Muslim historical buildings dating back to more than seven and eight centuries ago. An entire neighborhood, uh, neighborhood this is called Hart al Magharbi or the Moroccan Quarter, so the, which was constructed over 700 years ago in the age of the Ab Abuyid and the Mamluks, uh, which basically housed 650 people, 100 families, 135 homes, were flattened by Israel bulldozers in July 1967. So most of you, you know, they basically, you know, today when you see journalists, you see them posing in front of the wailing wall. What are you going to do about this, guys? I don't know where it's going. Is this is it loose wire? I have honestly no yeah. Maybe now you fix it. Okay. Let's see if it's yeah. no, no. <laughs> Let's move to the next. No, because they Yeah, by the time they come. So anyway. <laughs> I know it's very distracting, but I'll, I'm, you know, pretend, you know, you see it and then try to keep it in mind. But basically, I'm going to move fast forward here and talk, talk to you about basically Israel's plan for what they call it the Greater the Greater Jerusalem Bill. So the Israelis, you know, 19 before 1948, 1948, there was no East and West Jerusalem, what you hear about, you know, today, and there was only Jerusalem. So 1948, West Jerusalem, and this is where my family comes from was totally ethnically cleansed, you know, and they took over the whole town. There were very, very few Palestinians left in West Jerusalem. And for them uh, to implement the ethnic cleansing and, and, and controlling the city was very easy because by the time they arrived to West Jerusalem, they faced very little resistance, and many of the uh, most of the population started to leave because the attacks by the Zionist gangs and militias targeting different neighborhoods, Al Tapamon, Al Baqa, etc. So it was very easy for them to control. In 1967, Palestinians learned their lesson, right? So they learned their lesson. So they decided, okay, 1967, no matter what they do, we are not going to leave. Now, my family left West Jerusalem, and they came to East Jerusalem. And my parents, when they came, they were basically kicked out at gunpoint by the uh, uh, Urgun, which is one of the Zionist gangs. And so my parents, who were newly married, they had to start their life all over again from scratch, lost their ancestral home, and moved to East Jerusalem, this is where I was born. I am the first generation who was born outside our ancestral home, which was built more than 500 years ago. And then you'll, you'll see pictures of the house. We live the Dejanis, this is an area called, we call it Nabi Dahud neighborhood. And we lived there for at five to seven centuries in the same spot. So my, my generation, I and my, the rest of my siblings were born outside of our ancestral home. So 1967, and why I call this a battle? Because the battle continues. The Israelis want to make sure that they, they ethnically cleanse Jerusalem east and west and control it. So they came up with a new idea. They figured, well, now, you know, we got rid of them from West Jerusalem. Now we want to take over East Jerusalem. But there's too many of them. And things have changed, you know, because now you have satellite TV and you have reporters on the ground. 
their crimes are going to be watched by uh, the rest of the world. You know, they cannot, like when, when they went to, to Der Yassin, we only found out about Der Yassin from eyewitness reports and from stories. We had very few, we didn't have cameras on the ground, we didn't have reporters on the ground, so we had to be, base it on historical narrative. In 1967, they started to implement the Greater Jerusalem Bill, which basically said, it's called also otherwise known as the 30% to 70% plan. So their idea now said, okay, we can cope with these indigenous people, but we must be the majority. We have to be 70% of the population, and we have to reduce their number to 30%. If we keep them, we can put that pretense that Jerusalem is a united city, and this is, you guys had a lot of issues here with the mayor of occupied Jerusalem, Neil Barakat, when he came here. And this is where the Israeli Hasbara machine, you know, does its, when it does its work, they bring, you know, the mayor of Jerusalem, and he goes from campus to campus and speaking uh, engagements to talk about how peaceful is the city, and he's the mayor of a united city where Muslims, Jews, Christians live all in harmony and equality, which is total nonsense, right? So the plan, you know, and I talk about now, the plan is to build the population to 700 Israeli settlers, which by the way, 350 to 400 live in and around Jerusalem, so the focus is Jerusalem. And at the same time, preventing Palestinians from living there or reducing their number. For example, when I travel to Jerusalem, and my family tree goes 1,200 years. We have a family tree that my family tree on my father's side is 1,200 years. On my mother's side, my family used to be in Jerusalem, the Nusayba family. When Omar bin al-Khattab came in the 6th, 7th century to Jerusalem, and they were already there. So we don't know how far. But anyway, I can tell you it's further than it's Haq Shamir, it's further than Ariel Sharon, it's further than Netanyahu, that we've been living in Jerusalem. So when I go to Jerusalem, I am considered as a temporary resident of Jerusalem. And all my cousins are my entire family. We're not citizens. We are not permanent residents. We have identity cards, and in Hebrew, which translates into Arabic, it's called temporary residence. So this is the situation for the Jerusalemites, basically Palestinian Jerusalemites on the ground. They are temporary residents, meaning Israel can get rid of you anytime they want it to. If you are a student and you come to this country or any other country and you you study abroad and you don't come every second year to uh, visit your family and you re renew your laissez passe they can cancel your residency. They can turn you back and say you no longer live here. If you live in Jerusalem and you move to Ramallah, which is a few, few miles, or to Nablus, and they can prove that your center of life is no longer in Jerusalem, you lose also your identity card. If you marry someone outside, you know, even from the West Bank or Gaza, a Palestinian, you can also lose your identity card. They have a whole list of laws to basically get rid of you and reduce the number. So the ultimate goal really for them is basically to maintain that 30, per, 30 to 70 percent balance. Okay, so the situation on the ground, what you see now, they have completed the plan. The plan is complete. You know, before we get to Donald Trump making his commitment and, and moving the U.S. Embassy into Jerusalem, they've been working on this since 1967. They completed the total siege, basically a total ring of settlements, colonial settlements, you know, and they started since Oslo, and of course with the building of the apartheid po uh, wall, they put 22 checkpoints in and around Jerusalem, and travel, uh, traffic is funneled through three major checkpoints, basically from Jericho, the Jericho Road, the Bethlehem, the road, and the Ramallah Road. Many of you uh, probably have been through Kalandia and, and some of these checkpoints. So, so for Palestinians to access Jerusalem, they have to become, they are funneled now through three major checkpoints. 
and they are disconnected from the rest of the West Bank. They're, of course, disconnected from Gaza and disconnected from the, the rest of the world. In general, in the West Bank, you have 60 plus permanent checkpoints. And these are in the West Bank. And you have 2,941 flying checkpoints were counted in 2017. What I mean by flying checkpoints, these are check checkpoints that decide to place them whenever they feel, uh, the, the, you know, any, any time for security reasons, whatever. So Palestinians have to go, you know, just, just to give you an idea that when we talk about Jerusalem, and we talk, of course, life is a bit different, but Jerusalem is also one big prison to the Palestinian Jerusalemites living there and it's disconnected from the rest of the West Bank. So you have in, in, in 2,941 flying checkpoints, I don't have the number on 2018, it's still the year, but we'll have it. In 2016, 5,587 flying checkpoints. They've had 476 unstaffed physical obstacles, dirt, mounds, concrete blocks, and fences. Those are not checkpoints, they're just like, we'll bring a bulldozer and they'll you know, put a pile of stones so they block you from proceeding in traffic. And of course, last but not least, the famous apartheid wall, which basically now encircles Jerusalem. Okay. So, the plan to reduce the population, 30% and build the Jewish population, 30% Palestinian, 70% Jewish population, that's the ultimate goal. Isolate Palestinians from, from the, from Jerusalemites from the rest of Palestine and targeting Palestinian institutions. So this also started from 1967. So many of you probably heard uh, about the Orient House and this is, uh, was a very important meeting place for Palestinians. It's kind of de facto government place. They took it over, shut it down. Al-Quds University, which is um, the other major university, which started in Jerusalem, basically not too far from where my family lives, by the Palestine uh, Museum, which is AKA uh, the Rockefeller uh, Museum. Uh, they forced them now to go to Abu Dis neighborhood, which is outside the apartheid wall. Al-Makasid Hospital, they, taught, uh, they, they conducted, uh, which is the only Palestinian uh, Hospital, uh, uh, only uh, say, uh, Islamic Palestinian charitable hospital established, and my father is one of the founders of Al Makassar. They basically strangulated it and forced them to accept Israeli Kubat Halim insurance so they can no longer now be self reliant and become dependent on the Israeli government. Now, of course, they've been targeting religious institutions. We know what's going on at Dome of the Rock and at, at, at Al-Aqsa, and you probably all watched just about a year, a year ago or so when they wanted to put all these cameras and metal gates at Al-Aqsa. They've been targeting the only utility company, the Palestinian-owned electric company, and they uh, taxing it, uh, they are, um, basically not helping in its infrastructure. So eventually, if uh, this company cannot sustain, uh, it cannot be viable, Israel will take over the electric company because they have the money schools. They've been also targeting the curriculum at schools, shutting down NGOs. No Palestinian NGOs can operate inside Jerusalem. They have to be in Ramallah and outside. Of course, the transportation system, the tourist industry, uh, and this is a simple thing. If you wanted to book a hotel in Jerusalem, if you went to Hotels.com, most of the hotels that come first are hotels uh, owned in West Jerusalem by Israeli operators, and Palestinian hotels come last. If, uh, of course, and also you know Airbnb, that's why many Palestinians boycott Airbnb. Airbnb operates in Israeli settlements on stolen Palestinian land, and, and that's why Palestinians don't uh, do business with, Air, with Airbnb. Okay, so the media, right? So, and this is something not just in 
this is not the Israeli narrative, this is the narrative right here in the United States. And so this is how, you know, APAC and other organizations in this country try to capture the narrative, influence the narrative. Jerusalem is disputed territory. So it's no longer occupied. We no longer talk about Resolution 242. We no longer talk about the 1967 war. When you refer to it, you always, you, you always see it as a dis disputed territory. Uh, never refer to it as occupied. The dispute over Jerusalem is religious, which is nonsense, because we know historically, pre-1948, Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived together in harmony, and it's not until the establishment of the State of Israel that they created this uh, religious uh, dispute, which, which is not. It's, it's, it's uh, settler colonialism. That's, uh, this is the, the simplest way to describe it. And referring to the colonies, which we you know, uh, the illegal colonies now all around Jerusalem, I was seeing, and this is something I just came back, you've heard about the Khan al-Ahmar uh, incident, now they're trying to, <laughs> by the way, Israel has been kind, very kind recently, they're asking the Bedouins to destroy their own homes, you know, because they don't want the media to capture the, all the Israeli military and the bulldozers, and, and so they have been distributing notices telling people with an incentive, we'll give you $500 if you destroy your own home so we can move you next to a garbage dump. That's the proposed location. So uh, Khalil Ahmar, uh, I was reading in, in Reuters, and in Reuters they described Khalil Ahmar, and we call it a Bedouin village, which it is. I've been to Khalil Ahmar, and it has a school, children's school, it has a community, wherever. And in Reuters, they refer to it as a settlement. So. Here, the entire West Bank and what we call Area C is all taken over by illegal colonial settlements. They refer to Khan al Ahmar. They call our village as a settlement, but yet they refer to Har Homa, they refer to Ramat Ashkol, they refer to all these settlements as now neighborhoods. So, this is another uh, narrative. And of course, uh, they refer to the apartheid wall as a separation wall or a security fence, you know, like the fence that you have between you and your neighbors, the, the small picket fence. They don't like to talk about, you know, the 30 foot minimum height and, and all the uh, machine guns and all these things and the towers guarding it. And last but not least, Israeli citizens are Israeli Arabs, so they strip also the 1948 Palestinians from their identity by taking the word Palestinian from their identity. Okay, so this is something. This is a picture of my family in front of our historic home taken in 1942. These are all my ancestors. My my grandfather is in this picture. My my father is in this, this picture, and all my uncles. Of course, uh, for all the feminists here, no women were allowed to be in the pictures. They had to take separate <laughs> pictures. But this was a different era. We don't do this anymore. <laughs> OK, so since, you know, but uh, this is 1942. This is our home. And uh, of course, Trump wants to basically declare, and this is something I tweeted, which had a lot of uh, comments and, and retweets about uh, his decision to erase our history which of course we, he's not, because existence is resistance, and resistance is also existence for us. This is our home before 1948, and this handsome couple are my parents. So on, every time I go home, I always, uh, every time I go to Jerusalem, we don't live, my mom still is in Jerusalem, she's 91 years old, and I always go to visit our house. And the reason I'm able to open, to visit our house, because they have transformed it into yeshiva school. This is the irony, so <laughs> they've taken our ancestral home, and now they have religious students uh, living in our home. So I'm able to enter because it's open, so I enter with the tourists. And so this is a picture I took over our house in, uh, 
just like in August. And you see this guy, he's an evangelist, uh, and he was like blessing people and telling them stories. And I was like trying to listen what stories he was telling them. And it was, anyway, <laughs> all nonsense. And, and I wanted to interrupt and say, this, but this is my home. And I, <laughs> my wife said, no, let, let it go this time, because I've done that before. <laughs> and last but my, uh, not least, because we talk about ancestors, this is also behind our house, our cemetery. This is where my grandfather is buried and my great uncles are buried there. So our history, we are part of the land, our bones are in the land, and they prevent us from taking care of our cemetery, and it also always gets defaced by, by settlers. Anyway, that's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I talk too much. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you, Tony, and thank you. This is really amazing. I just want to say one thing before we start the film, because we want to make sure that we have, we don't have enough, you know, enough time for discussion. But yesterday, 25th of September, 24, actually two days ago, was the fifth anniversary of the passing of Professor Edward Said. And, and the reason I'm saying, Huh? 25th, yesterday. It, no, actually it was 24th. No. Yesterday, I, it wasn't 24th, it was 24th. I remember because I organized the memorial for him. I know, it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. I organized the memorial for him at New York University, actually, that uh, evening. But uh, the reason I mention him here in this context, both for two reasons. One is that in, on November 1st, GOPS is actually marking, generally in Pakistan student, is uh, marking the anniversary of the Palestinian year of honoring the late Professor Edward Said. Two is because actually it is very relevant to the discussion both Tony and Jamal have raised. Tony was talking about the lands of the indigenous people and our ancestors. And Jamal was talking about belonging and Jerusalem. That Edward Said comes from Jerusalem and his family home in an area called Talbiya, which Israel now calls Tel Aviv. And the home of Edward Said used to be marked. So when you go to visit Jerusalem, you will see this is where Edward Said's home was marked, as well as many homes of Palestinians. But then Israel destroyed the markings. So when you go, you do not know where, whose home is where and where it is. But he does remain and he does exist and we honor him and we remember him from the fifth anniversary of his passing. We do have a direct connection with him at San Francisco State then you will we also have the Edward Said Scholarship. I'm go going to post the link so you can uh, see it. So we are going to be moving now to watch the film, because it is 90 minutes, so we, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, and we're going to move into it. I know you want to have, you have a lot of discussions, as well, but if we're gonna have a discussion, we're not going to see the film. So students, do you want to kind of like watch part of the film and have a discussion? Or it's fine. You have to watch the film on your own because I'm going to be asking you questions about it. So please watch my class. So we can have a, dis a discussion. How about we can do a discussion for 15 minutes and then we go into the film. Okay. So questions, not speeches. If you want to make speeches, we can do it later. So nine, 30 second question, Brian. Uh. What was it that they turned your home into, uh, your ancestral home again? A yeshiva school. A yeshiva school? How yeah, which is it? a Jewish religious uh, school. Uh, so the students live in the house and study the Torah. Okay. It's Y-E-S-H-I-V. -E okay, any other questions? Can you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for Tony. Yes. Go ahead. Um, how did it come to be that you were in Lebanon? All uh, right. And uh, what did you do there? <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I was in the Chicano movement at that time. And uh, we had a meeting in Mexico City, 1979. Uh, it was for the liberation of Puerto Rico. And Lolita Lebron, if some of you know Lolita Lebron, Puerto Rican human rights nationalist was there. She had been in prison here in the United was released States. Released in 79. Lolita right. Lebron was released in 79. on a, a peace or an exchange uh, with Cuba and others. But Lolita Lebron and other Puerto Ricans had gone into the U.S. Congress and shot it up 
with pistols around 1952. She went to prison, she was released. Anyway, a big international <laughs> conference in Mexico City for the liberation of Puerto Rico, Lolita Lebron, and I met, met the Palestinian delegation there. Uh, and I was with a delegation of Chicanos from throughout the Southwest. Uh, and, and we were also with the political party, La Raza Unida Party, yeah. very nationalist oriented organization. Uh, um, and the Palestinian uh, delegates uh, invited us to Beirut, to Lebanon, yeah. and, uh, uh, which uh, we accepted. So we can bring back the story of Palestine throughout the Southwest, which we have uh, since we continue uh, expressing that solidarity. But it was in 79, mm -hmm. Mexico City, we met the Palestinian uh, delegates. And what did you do in Lebanon? Pardon? For one month. Oh, for a month? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, no, I, was, I, uh, I had the great pleasure of being with young people. Uh, mind you, I said I was about 30, 31, and I was hanging out with young Palestinians who were 19, 20, 21, and uh, during my month there, sometimes they pick me up in their Volkswagen, and we go cruising through Beirut, and they're trying to live a normal teenager life, looking for girls, you know, having trying to have a social life. So it was Palestinian men. Yeah, and and I'm with the guys. <laughs> no, and I, I'm with the guys, and they have their their weapons, their AK-47s, on the floor. So we're cru I'm cruising around with these guys at night, and we're having a blast. Or I went to the, the Palestinian uh, camps, to the hospitals. <coughs> that's where I met uh, uh, the, uh, the brother of Yasser Arafat, the doctor who was in charge at that time. And I met uh, the amputees, and saw some of the amputation work that was underway. Uh, so uh, that's what I did. Uh, was it just you, Tony, or was there a whole bunch of people? I was initially with uh, about maybe uh, 12 Chicanos from the Southwest, and a lot of them had to go back, but I stayed I stayed behind. And uh, you know, at night, uh, or in the mornings, I'd get up with the guys, and we'd go swimming in the Mediterranean. You know, at like six in the morning, we were out swimming in the Mediterranean, <laughs> you know, and working out, and. And I was invited to speak at the American University in Beirut. In Beirut. And, uh, and always we were waiting for the invasion that might be coming from the Israelis, which occurred two years later. In eight, uh, 1982, the big invasion uh, did happen. And uh, also went out into the mountains uh, to overlooking the Latani River. So some of you know that it's, all, it's also a war for water. And the Tani River is a very major, important river up in that area, and the Israelis want it. And that's where the big war uh, and conflict is held at also. I remember we were up there on the mountains with Palestinians overlooking the Latani, uh, the Tani River, and we, were, and we started getting bombarded. You know, rounds were coming, and uh, they hustled us into the cars, and we, as we were driving, I'm not kidding you, uh, bombs were going off. Bombs that were coming in were, were blowing up on both sides of the car as we were being driven off you know, to safety because uh, we were under their care and security as well. So it, it was really an adventuresome, memorable moments. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, uh, I think in Alhambra, in the Alhambra area. West Beirut, yeah. And uh, Beirut at one time was the Paris <laughs> of, of what's called the Middle East. Beirut was the place. And uh, by the time I got there in 80, uh, it was pretty much blown up. It was demarcated. A civil war. It was a civil war. The, the phalange were, were roaming the streets. These are right-wing uh, uh, Mennonite uh, religion or something. Uh, the phalange. Uh, uh, just many groups. So you had to know uh, where to walk and where to be, uh, uh, so yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, in particular, I learned uh, how the Palestinian uh, movement uh, also generated a lot of its money because it did have about one or two billion dollars that it was operating with. 
in the 80s, it was receiving a lot of money. It was the number one uh, uh, machine force that had a media uh, propaganda machine. It had a it had a very strong machine, and Vanessa Redgrave was uh, very supportive of it. She made a film on on uh, the Palestinian uh, movement. But I learned in particular uh, the young people they go around to each block. This is in a revolutionary way. You go to each neighborhood block and you collect money, a little bit of money, whatever is affordable, from everybody in that neighborhood that goes that went into into the budget. So. That's uh, you know what I learned too in terms of how to develop my own network here in the Southwest and how how to uh, how to uh, how to secure some monies for the movement. I want to um, ask, see if people want to have questions for Jaman, but I would like to say three things. One is that you know we're having intergenerational conversation, so I am sure Tony would be would welcome, or he would be coerced into welcoming students who would like to interview him and actually record these memories. Two is that in, in actually 2008, when we did the 50th anniversary of the strike, we did organize a roundtable conversation, which was also between elders and young people. We have it on video, and it's part of the students who are in my class will find it, and if it's not, just let me know and I can share it with you. We had many people who were elders who, this is that was the first time that I hear Tony was to introduce himself, and I said, well, he said, when I was in the, with the PLO in Lebanon, I did a double take, because I did not know we invited Tony because he was representing the American Indian movement. We, we didn't know about the direct connection with the fact, but he was talking about this, and it actually, and also Madonna Thunderhawk, two years ago, we, I, I organized a, a round table at the Berkshire Forum and Plenary, and she was saying that we were interacting with the PLO and the PLO, came and we had all these conversations about decolonization and so on. So there is a lot of oral history that's not written. And I think it's really important between all our communities. And I think it's really important to, to, uh, to talk about that. Last week we had a big conference on the annihilation of women and war at McGill University in Montreal. And some of the people we had were actually involved with a group called Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon, JMIN, who were active in New York. And so there is, last year we had an anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila, which we organized in the Richard Oaks Multicultural Center. Richard Oaks was a student at San Francisco State. And he was one of the people who led the takeover of Alcatraz. So you can see how the connections are coming in. And last year we also had people who were speaking. Jaime spoke about what was going on in New York. Steve Goldfield, who's here in the Bay Area, spoke about what was going on in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of this stuff that's not written. And it's really, really important to be able to have this intergenerational conversation. Next week, again, Madonna Thunderhawk will be there, Tony will be there, Bill Means is moderating, which is actually a huge honor uh, of the film festival. So please come, learn, hear, engage, <coughs> examine, interview. I want to ask if people would like to have any questions for Jamal about Jerusalem. As you know, the, 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 the November 1st mural is going to be focusing on Jerusalem, but there is a lot. Questions? Yes. I have a question. Um, and raise your voice, please. Yes. Uh, when you, you go to Jerusalem every year, right, to visit um, the place where you used to live, um, and I was wondering what you think when you go there, or what you would like to do, or what you'd like to happen, like, specific to that. I mean, because that must be so crazy to have to see that. What do you mean specific to that? To, to um, specific to like, Jerusalem, or? Um, just in seeing where the location of your home used to be. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you want to have there instead? Or what, what could possibly like, do, do for you? Well, we want to return home. Yeah. Uh, not just my family, but millions of Palestinians. And so for us, when I go, because I actually made a point, and I came to this country as a student. So my father used to make sure that every year he must come and visit, so I used to visit every year. Did you need to study? But after I graduated and I studied, and he said, he, every year he used to tell me, you better come see me because I might die this year. So I always had this guilt. <laughs> he, had this, he said that, you know, every year he was like, oh, are you gonna come? Because it, this might be my last year. <laughs> and so I always lived with this guilt. And so every year I made sure, and then of course after he passed, I continued this because my mom 
lived there. And the biggest thing, of course, for me, and that's why sometimes I'm shocked, and I have to say it, when I meet Palestinians who are living here, and some of them haven't been there, or they haven't been there for 20 years, or, haven't, or some of them, they go there and they are in a shock, in a deep shock, I remember, because they leave the area for 20 years, and they go and they said, oh my God, I couldn't recognize my, the road to my own village. Uh, I couldn't, because every year I was witnessing, I am an eyewitness, and of course my father is an eyewitness, and my grandfather is an eyewitness, but I'm an eyewitness uh, to the 1967 war, because I lived through there, and I'm actually working on a book which includes uh, stories about this, but I'm also an eyewitness on the daily, and, and yearly, I shouldn't say yearly, but also in 2016 I spent a year there, so, you know, of the yearly ethnic cleansing, yearly change in demographics, yearly cultural appropriation, and yearly changes of, in to, topography. So when you go there, for people who don't see that, they're in, in, in a big shock. For me, it's like, I'm gonna, this year, okay, let me see what I left off. And every time I go there, and that's why, you know, you know, for most people they see a small news story, you know, the uh, Netanyahu government approved the building of 200 new uh, buildings or in, in a settlement. I actually witnessed this. I see it. I see the land. I hear the stories. I talk to the people. I see the people who lost their, their land. It's very painful to tell you the truth. And it, it never gets better. And it's a, it's, it's a reminder, but I feel the urge that I must keep seeing this. Now what I want, I mean, this is a whole different story, and I've shown my film Occupied Minds at one of the classes, and then the other one, maybe you'll tell Gus if they like to come see it. For me, they, where we got to this point now, <clears throat> and uh, I don't support them, you know, the two-state solution, I don't support any of these things, it's, uh, it's nonsense, and it's not gonna work. And whatever solution they're, they're gonna arrive to, it will be a band-aid, and, and, and it will be a perpetual war. We have been done injustice. We have refugees. We have people who lost their homes. And I'm not against, we're not this, this myth that they created, we wanna drive the Jews to the sea, and we wanna get, to, no, that's not, it's not about Which us. was never a true quote. It's not, it, it's not, it's not, this is not the truth. And so the only solution that I see is a one-state solution, a democratic, secular state, which basically what Palestine was before, whether it be under the British mandate or when it was part of, of the governorate of Great Syria, you know, they tried to tell you Palestine didn't exist, you didn't have an aspiration, but all nation states in Europe didn't exist, you know, and so we were part of basically different caliphates, right? In, the last of which was the Ottomans, and we had the you know, Apicides, and we had the uh, Rashidin, and so forth. And so, you know, the Palestinian identity has been there for centuries. And, and, and so they, what I'd like to see, I'd like to see justice. And the only way we can see justice is for people who lost their homes to be able to come back. Some, Maybe they don't want to come back. If they don't want to come back, not a single Palestinian received one dime in compensation. So when we talk, so, so if they want to receive compensation, that's their prerogative, but no state should dictate that. Donald Trump cannot dictate that my hometown, Jerusalem, is no longer my capital. It's no longer my home. Donald Trump wants to determine that I'm no longer a refugee. Well, guess what? I'm the son of a refugee. I was born up there after 1948, and you know what? My birth certificate, I was born in 1957, is stamped by the UNRWA as a refugee, as a, as a son of a refugee. And this is my part of my identity, and this is his second, this is his so-called, which we all know, this is his so-called uh, great deal of the century, the deal of the century. He wants to strip Palestinians of their national aspiration and, and their capital. He wants to strip Palestinians of their identity as a refugee, meaning like he wants to say to all the refugees who live in refugee camps and elsewhere around the world, 
you no longer have a claim. And that's what I want to see, justice. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Tony. And with that, we will start with you. Can I just push it? Mm -hmm. You press the space bar. Jumps. Here we go. Yeah. No, we can't turn off all the lights because then we cannot be closed. Oh. And people can turn around. Doesn't it show over there? Does it show? No, it's not showing. Yeah, that's it. Like a bug yeah. for every uh, uh, עכשיו 
ידעו שלראות באנשים אני מסוכן. אז אמרו, אוקיי, בועז, אתה תראה איך הוא משתיק כל לפני הכוח. אתה יודע איך זה, כל אחד יש חבר עורך דין, חבר רופא וחבר מטפל ולפעמים אתם צריכים לשלם את המחיר. כן, אבל חבר עורך דין שלך אתה לא היית יכול בשביל שחצי בבוקר ככה. חבר עורך דין שלי חוסך לי פי עשר יותר כסף. אתה יודע, יש דבר אחד שאני לא מבין. איך יכול להיות שהייתי צריך את החלום של בועז עם הכלבים המשוגעים שלו בשביל להפעיל את הזיכרון שלי? משהו שהוא חיצוני לחלוטין. עכשיו, את הזיכרון זה דבר מאוד מעניין. תספר לך איזה ניסוי שידוע בפסיכולוגיה. לקחו, 
אתה של אנשים, ואמרו להם, איזה תמונות מהילדות שלהם. יש תמונות, היו תמונות אמיתיות מחוויות של ילדות שלהם, ותמונה אחת הייתה מזויפת. לקחו את הדמויות שלהם ושקלו אותם בלונה פרק, שהם לא היו. שמונים אחוז מהאנשים זיהו מיד את הסוף התמונה שהם לא היו בכלל, הם זיהו את הסוף. העשרים אחוז היותר נורמליים שלא זכרו, הלכו הביתה, אנחנו גם אומרים תחשבו, אולי תזכרו. הם חזרו עם התמונה, אמרו נזכר. היינו בלונה פרק, היינו עם ההורים בלונה פרק, היינו יום נהדר, הם נזכרו ובנו לעשות את החוויה. שההזיה שלי על הטבע זה כמו התמונה בלונה פארק, זה לא קרה באמת, אני המצאתי את זה, אין לזה שום אחיזה במציאות. אני לא יודע מה, אפשר לבדוק את זה, לא? מי היה איתך שם? היה איתי כרמי, אני זוכר את זה מהתיכון, והיה איתי עוד בן שאני לא מזהה בכלל. לך תשאל את כרמי, מה הוא זוכר? זה עולם. עשרים שנה זה עולם. ניסע לעולם, תשאל אותו אם זה חשוב, אם הוא מעיק עליך. זה לא נראה לך קצת מסוכן, שאולי אני אגלה לעצמי דברים שאני לא רוצה לדעת? נראה לי שאתה תגלה דברים, זה חשוב לך לדעת, דברים שאתה רוצה לדעת. אתה לא תעבור את הגבול של... אתה לא תיכנס למקומות שאתה לא רוצה להיכנס, יש מנגנון אנושי כזה שחוסם אותך ולהיכנס לאזורים אפלים שאתה לא רוצה להיכנס אליהם. אתה תגיע בדיוק לאן שאתה צריך להגיע עם הזה. כל זה מין קוף פלאפל. כל זה מין קוף פלאפל. וואלה. בואו, בוא תראה. כמה קל אתה נותן? שלוש שנים מספיק. תחילת שנות ה-90 היה לי איזה דוכן קטן באוטרה. ואז טרנדי כל העסק הזה של הטבעוני, אתה יודע, התחיל מהכיתה המלאה. עכשיו תחשוב פלאפל, זה גם טבעוני וגם אוריינטל. אנשים חשבו, תהיה פיזיקאי, תהיה מדען אטום. זה מה שהם בדיוק. לא יודע, ההורים שלי, ההורים שלך, אנשים שעמדו איתנו, חשבו שעכשיו הוא יגיד בגיל 40 ומשהו, אתה יכול להיות מאוד מאוד אימא. בגיל 20 כבר לא יכולתי להיות שום דבר. קרא אותך, קרא לי, קרא לי, מת מקור, מת. מת מקור, אבל אני אכנס. יכול להיות שצריך ללכת ברגל, כל זה. זה מצחיק שהופעת עכשיו, אתה יודע מה? שצלצלת עליו. יצאתי בדיוק עם הבן שלי, תומאס, אתה יודע, הוא עכשיו פה בן שבע. הוא יצא עם רובה פלסטיק החוץ ומשחק. ותוך כדי הוא התחיל לשאול אותי כל מיני שאלות. איפה הייתי בצבא? אם יריתי פעם עם בן אדם? אתה לא איתה? אני יודע. בוא, בוא, בוא ניכנס, בוא ניכנס, אני אתן לך. תגיד, אכפת לך שאני מצייר אותך פה עם הילד שלך בשלג? לא אכפת לי בכלל. תראה כמה שאתה רוצה. אני הכי קרוב, טוב? כל עוד אתה מצייר ולא מצלם זה בסדר.
actually, according to Thomas Friedman, of the New York Times, they weren't just Christian Lebanese. And the civil war was not about Christian Muslim. The, the Lebanese civil war was about actually the whole question of who is going to assume power in Lebanon at the time. And the way it gets constructed, and a lot of narratives, which I believe that really need to be questioned, is that, that it was really be between Palestinians, it was Christians and Muslims, and between Palestinians who are taking over Lebanon and Lebanese who want to defend Lebanon. And this wasn't really what it was. The, the Lebanese, the conflict in Lebanon, as in other parts of the world, has been going on for a very long time. Actually, it dates, if you want to, you can date it in different times, but 1943, when the French colon colonizers left Lebanon, they left a recipe in which they divided the power in Lebanon among different uh, religious sects. They set up, and until since 1943, they don't do census in Lebanon, because if they do the census now, it's going to mess up the whole equation. So there is issues there. The United States has been involved a lot. In 1958, the US actually Marines invaded Lebanon to support the uh, Lebanese uh, people in power against the tobacco workers who were striking. Okay, so there is a lot of history going on. Now the Palestinian, there are refugee camps in Lebanon as they were in Jordan, as they were in Syria, and people know that because it's after, especially people in the class, in the Palestine court, because we've talked about Nakba, we've discussed all of the stuff, so you know the secret to before 1982, the Lebanese civil war continues in 1982, Israel invades Lebanon. That is really the most really important event. In June, in June 1982, June 6, Israel invades Lebanon, and that's what they say, they get to the, the Beirut. They actually get to, and they bar, they're bombing there. And the people who are defending Beirut against the Israeli and the Falange are both Lebanese and Palestinians, and many of the Lebanese are Christians, yeah. who are also defending and working, and, and the Palestinians are Christians. Mm -hmm. Christians, Lebanese, and also not just Palestinians. There's people from around the world that actually, who are actually fighting with the Palestinians at that uh, time. What happens is that Israel installs Bashir Jmeir as president because it was Israeli rule, so they install him as president. And many Lebanese were not very happy with it. They did not really want him to be installed. He was assassinated. There, he goes to a meeting, there is a bomb that blows up, and actually nobody knows, and now we know there is a guy who's, who was accused of placing the bomb, but it wasn't Palestinian. Palestinians didn't have anything to do with it. And actually all the Palestinian fighters had already been evacuated from Beirut based on an agreement that the United States government has brokered, the US envoy, Philip Habib, has brokered for the Palestinian refugees, the PLO, to all leave Lebanon. They were all, they had already been evacuated. And both the Israeli uh, military as well as the Lebanese phalange, and the, they, they, they were, there were no fighters in the camps. There were no mm -hmm. fighters left anyway. They, were, they all had gone, okay? And so, as you say, you see here, and this is, this is an Israeli, this is very interesting, this is an Israeli soldier story who is actually trying to figure out whether he remembers or he doesn't remember. It begins with the dogs, because he's very traumatized about killing 26 dogs. Very traumatized, remembers that, has nightmares about it, but doesn't remember, or his mind refuses to remember that he was actually there when the killing was going on. And so, they, yes, the, the Lebanese phalange went in, but I actually interviewed survivors of the massacre who also said that they saw Israeli soldiers who were there. Now, the accounts, there are different accounts, but we do know the flare-up, this is Sharil Sharon, who was the Israeli, quote-unquote, defense minister, minister of war, who ordered the flare-ups to actually make it easier for the killing to, get, to, to go on. And uh, the Israeli military knew what was going on, and this is uh, the accounts. The Kahan Commission, which was a commission established by the Israeli government, uh, established that Sharon was responsible and the Israeli government was responsible. Menachem Begin, who's the Israeli prime minister at the time, actually did not allow all the secret stuff to be released. And I posted today on Facebook, I haven't just posted in the class, but I will do it you know, tomorrow, is that today the Journal of Palestine Studies came out with many of the secret evidence from them that was released to them by William Quant, who at the time was member of the National Security Council of uh, 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 um, Carter, but he was, he was no longer, because Reagan was in power at that time. 
But he was a consultant. William Cobb was a consultant to Time Magazine, because Time Magazine was sued by Ariel Sharon, the Israeli Defense Minister at the time, under the label of libel. Time Magazine said that Sharon was responsible. So Sharon said, no, I'm not responsible. You are smearing me. So he went and sued Time Magazine. And William Cobb was one of the people who was retained by Time Magazine as a consultant. And he saw a lot of the secret evidence that Israeli government refused to put out. So it, was it revenge? Was it not revenge? I, you know, I, I, all we know is that there were people in the camp, at least, at least, Bayan Hut documents 1,400 people were killed. Some people say 700, some people say at least 3,000. The problem is you cannot actually know how many people were killed because the killing began on September 16th, ended on September 18th. And by that time, it was too hot. A lot of the bodies had decomposed. Also, there were a lot of mass graves. So, I mean, the stuff is, I have to I mean, tell you that I did interview a lot of the survivors of the massacre, and the description is, this is not it. What you see here is not it, compared to what you hear about what's going on. Uh, so it wasn't, I don't know if it was, I guess I would say is how you tell the story and how what's narrative to tell and so on actually has something to do with it. So if we make it as a revenge, it's kind of like, okay, Arabs are emotional. These phalanges are emotional. They got upset. Their president got killed. So we, they need to go in and so it becomes like justifiable almost. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's actually it's quite problematic because it's not. But I think the other question, I think, Kelly, what you were saying is that the question of authority, I think it's a question we need to think about because, well, these were not middle age, but when is personal culpability? Individual culpability and when is state culpability? There's institutional and there is individual. And I would, uh, uh, I'm, some of you probably were too young, uh, when the Abu Ghraib uh, scandal took place, when, when, when the pictures of the US soldiers and the guards were actually taking pictures of humiliating Iraqi soldiers, stacking them on top of each other. They took 80,000 pictures, 80,000 pictures. And Congress did not allow any pictures of women to be released. Only they allowed only pictures of Arab men to be released. And there was a discussion about this uh, woman, Lindy England, who was a poor, white, working class woman who actually went into the military a draft. It's an economic draft, right? There is no draft, but there's an economic draft. So it's not what happened to Tony or Heine in the, in the Vietnam War that you were drafted, now you are economically drafted, right? So when is the personal culpability and responsibility completely nil, just because people are following orders? And I found it really interesting because they keep bringing up Nazism. They talked about Warsaw <coughs> multiple times. I mean, this is Israeli because today, if anybody who is making comparison is accused of anti-Semitism, right? So this is Israelis who are raising this question and saying basically, how could, how could this happen? Which it's very interesting because how could this happen assuming that the people who were actually victimized in Nazism are the ones who are who doing it? I, I think it's a very like simplistic equation. I don't, but it raises questions about who is responsible and what do you talk about responsibility, both individual and institutional, and also what do you do about it? And I'm, I'm also interested as, in this class, which is questions I raised to you, how do you tell the story? And which story do you tell? And what do we think about that? Like next week, when we go October 8th to the, to the American Indian Movement Film Festival, you will see a different, the story of the children meeting at the border is very different than this story, okay? It's, uh, it's children, refugee children, that many of them survived Sabra and Shatila. Many of them have actually interviewed from the Shatila. Uh, camp and from Hesha, both, in both parts. And we did actually last time we were there in March, right? March. And one of the kids who was in the little kids in the picture is actually for, who the person who led us around and gave us the interview and so on. It's a bit different story. So I think even that raises how do you tell the story? What story do you tell? And what do you, how do you honor the victims? The people who are dead and alive. And at the same time, what do you think about that? And how do you, um, as a person who is also interested not in, teach, in teaching as well as in also changing, making changes towards justice, I'm always wondering, so what do we take out of it? Because we do, you do want to honor the dead, 
You would do one another victim, but you also don't want to get completely debilitated. And just, you want to mourn, but also how you're going to make sure that this doesn't happen anywhere, not only to the Palestinians, to anybody, okay? How do you do that? How do you kind of like, what sort of, is it only enough to kind of like for the soldiers, the Israeli soldiers in this film, to only go through the whole self-exploration, you know, the, the, and it's important, and it's not that important. I mean, I was, I've never seen this film before. This is just like you, this is the first time I've seen it, okay? So if I actually have seen it before, I would have probably like told you some trigger warning, this is what's going, because I've never seen it. I've been wanting to see it, and some of the reviews I read about it, they, I think they were not actually as fair as I, I think the film looked, for me, I think there's a lot of important things that it's saying. I, and I think the question maybe I'll think differently tomorrow and I read from now and so on, because you know, people change when they think about things. You know. <coughs> but I think that's the question of our, one of the questions, not one question. How do you tell the story? And which is the story? And this is the guy who's going into this whole psychological reckoning, basically, really, that's what he's saying, this story, with his own individual responsibility and what he was doing then. But it also tells a lot of the stuff of what happened at the time. I do know, for me, Sabra and Jazeera changed my life. I mean, it changed my life completely. I quit school. I decided to become an activist. I mean, really, just, it just, it was, for me, like, nothing was worth anything except to try to change the world. And I think I made it. I shouldn't have quit school. So I mean, <laughs> I'm highly recommended against it. But it's, I mean, it's, it, it was the, the war, the, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the massacre, where a watershed event in the history of the region, the history of Palestine, you know, for multiple levels. So I'm going to, a few more minutes, so I'm going to stop and... Yes, Tony. Yes, I, I just want to say, as I said, I consider myself a war criminal in Vietnam as an infantryman. And, uh, uh, I think what they didn't say when they were testifying, their participation and, and their witnessing, is what I felt. The second time I was wounded, I really was so filled with anger, frustration, hate, and the feeling that I was lied to, mm -hmm. that I was lied to all my life. I used to be an altar boy. And then when I said, that, what happened, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And I was in the middle of that killing field myself. And it occurred to me that, oh my God, what have I done? You know, I don't know if you ever saw uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. It's a, it's a classic yeah. movie, you ought to see it. Mm -hmm. But where that major, didn't get it till the very end that he built the bridge to be blown. <laughs> and he was a fool the whole time. He, like he was lied to. So I think that's a, a feeling as an infantryman and part, being a participant and you realize what you've done and you've been lied to all your life. And I've been in the struggle, social justice ever since coming back. I had to live with myself. I went through alcohol. I was married, I married before I went to Vietnam. And my wife couldn't stand me when I came back. So I was adrift for many years to come to terms with myself. That's why I came back to the circle of life. I came back to my community, my Indian healing took over. So I can understand that, the, you know, it's the feeling of being lied to. Yes, go ahead. Your mask off? Oh. Um, yeah, I was thinking about where you said that you consider yourself a war criminal, um, like after that ended, because it's like, it's like you know, these people, most of them don't know what they're getting into, but they still, they still do it. Um, and I, as of late, have I've been thinking a lot about personal responsibility, and I, I think at the end of the day, this is just me, but I think at the end of the day, you're always responsible for your own actions because no one else is. Um, it's only you, and that's not even like a blame thing. It's just a fact. You, you are the only one who can kill them, and you can only, you always have a choice. But it's complicated. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm gonna ask other people. Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, um, like your comment.
comment and your husband not being on it reminds me of this um, primary source account I read of a Viet um, an American soldier in Vietnam who was was flying a helicopter and he came upon the My Lai massacre in mm -hmm. the Vietnam War and um, he landed it and he put himself between um, a fellow American soldier and the family yeah. and so I think that <clears throat> there's always um, your humanity that exists at the end of the day and when it comes to innocent people and it could be used different when someone's shooting at you and they're also a soldier but when it comes to innocent people it's a, it's a whole yeah it's a whole accountability and, and that's just connecting in, in more than human my colleague and I'm gonna ask how about that people speak yeah yes that soldier's, that soldier's name was Hugh Thompson and uh, it's interesting, it's good, I'm, I'm happy you raised it because recently they made a big deal about, uh, what's his name, John, John, McCain. John McCain, who passed away, who was a war criminal. Mm -hmm. He was a war criminal. And uh, much is made about what he went through as a captured prisoner, but no one talks about you, Thompson. They don't talk about him. There's no memory of him. And his um, his co-pilot, both of them literally got in between the unit that was killing the Vietnamese villages. And that's, you know, that's an amazing story. Um, and I wanted to just, maybe just briefly add. Briefly. Yeah, briefly. <laughs> Mi Lai is, is, is uh, but the thing about the massacres also, as, a tr as, a, as brutal and as atrocity, it also is a very significant moment, uh, which shapes a lot of us. So for a lot of us, uh, for the 60s, Mi Lai and other events during that war really affected us, similar to what Rabao was saying, how it would affect it hard. I myself, I, I didn't go to college after that either. And I was facing the draft. In the war against Central America, we also had massacres uh, by U.S. trained uh, militaries in Honduras, Guatemala, uh, yeah, in Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador. I mean, I you can go over that, but uh, and that was also singular. I think Beirut, uh, beyond the Palestinians, uh, it really was a, a singular moment uh, that did impact the world and many of Jewish, both here and in Israel, and really propelled a, a, a shift in the conception of Israel as this um, besieged besiege country. It shifted because it showed that, that the invasion and the brutality of it uh, was guided by a particular ideological orientation. And so that is really, I think, uh, uh, broke with the image that prevailed before, the her heroism of uh, Israel in 67, the heroism of Israel before that, and it really pushed forward the uh, opposition beyond the Palestinians and made, and widened, you know, of course, the Palestinians still have a lot of difficulties in terms of how the narrative is told, but it definitely shifted and really impacted many, many people, and especially, I think, in, uh, in the Jewish community. Actually, in Israel, it's very important that you say that, but in Israel, there is a group that was formed in Lebanon called Parents Against, uh, Parents for Peace or Parents Against Silence. There were soldiers who were actually began to protest until 1980, 2000, when Israel had to withdraw from the south of Lebanon because of I mean, there is conscious of the fighting, of course, people were resisting, the Lebanese were resisting, specifically the Lebanese, mostly were resisting the Israeli occupation, which lasted until 2000, and there's still parts are occupied. But also, it really created a lot of what, what we come to see, to think about as the peace movement in Israel. It really created that. In the US, as I mentioned earlier, that there was this group, I, I know in New York, was Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. In the Bay Area, there were multiple groups. I do not know about them because I was, I, I followed the New York stuff more. So I think this is an invitation for people who are interested in doing oral. 
to talk to people and find out what happened. But I think also it's really, uh, so there was a lot of solidarity and one of the things that I wanted to refer you to, and you should look it up, the very well-known poem by June Jordan, the 100,000 Palestinian in Beirut, and I didn't know and nobody told me, and she continued about, and she was made into songs and songs, actually quite powerful. I, 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 I and actually, Roy this is, it is, Roy, Roy and Roy Brown, Roy Brown, a Puerto Rican singer, composed a song about it, and actually was performing it at all the Palestinian events and all the solidarity events for free. Another part of the solidarity that, that has been going. So there's a lot of the stuff that was happening at the time, and I think this is something for people to also think about. But I think the other thing also is really important to think is that as we tell the stories, as we understand and learn about the stories of people who are in solidarity, of people who are opposing their the governments, what the government is doing and so on. What about the stories of the people who were victimized at the center of it? So it's, I think it's really important to also recenter not only the victims who alive and dead, but also the whole, I mean, this is a class about Palestine, right? So I think it's really important to think about what does this mean? What the impact of this particular massacre, which kind of continues other massacres and so on, but what does it mean in terms of the Palestinian movement itself? I mean, this is kind of like it was a rude awakening well, for some Palestinians, some of the people you were talking about, Tony, that basically believed the US. And they said, OK, the US is going to guarantee the safety of the people, the civilians, we're going to leave. I mean, like, why would you, on what basis? What is it in the history of the US? made the Palestinian leadership believe that the U.S. is actually <laughs> going to honor its word. It never honored its word to anybody, including to people here in the U.S. So why is it? What was it about the Palestinian leadership that actually agrees to be evacuated that made them agree to evacuate? And I think this is something that's actually really important to think about, is that what, what and what would it that Palestinians, then they go around and now we're still are facing the effects of Oslo and so on. So what does this mean? Like when people do it again and again and again and every single time they say the U.S. has stopped being an honest broker. And I'm always asked, when was the U.S. an honest broker? <laughs> With the history of the U.S. And I'm, I'm not actually, I'm not even making an ideological <laughs> argument. I'm actually going through the history of the U.S. from Wilson, who supported the Balfour Declaration and the and the early Zionist movement and so on, and basically crushed any kind of opposition to Zionism, in the, not directly, but in, in the support and so on, and it continues until today, and within the Jewish community. So it's, I think it's really important to also think about what does this all mean? What does this all mean in terms of politics? What does this mean about the regular administration? What does this mean about the US promises? What does it mean about the Palestinian leadership itself, and what does it mean for the question of Palestine in general, and the history, and the past, and the, the future. So I think, but thinking about all of this stuff, but also the other thing that I don't want you to leave with, I don't want you to, I mean, it's a very depressing event. It's a horrible event. It's a massacre. It's something that it's scarred in people's consciousness. And when you go to Shatila, by the way, it is not two camps. It's one camp, Shatila. Sabra is the Lebanese neighborhood next door. So the massacres happen in the Lebanese neighborhood called Sabra and the Palestinian refugee camp called Shatila. So there isn't a camp called Sabra. People think that it's two, the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila. No, it's one refugee camp. It's a neighborhood next, next to it. But I think it's also really important to think that was 1982. This was a horrible massacre. And today, Palestinians are still going to in great march of return. Palestinians are in Khan al-Ahmar refusing to leave. And the reason we hear about this is because they are refusing to leave. That's the reason we hear about it, because otherwise there wouldn't be any Palestinian left. It would, the whole narrative would be erased. It wouldn't exist. So I think it's really kind of like important to also remember that, and also remember the fact that all of you are here taking a class late at night, and other people <coughs> are coming to participate, and all of the stuff that's going on, even at the time when our own program is being crushed. You know? So I think it's a, it's, it's important to keep that in mind, that there is something about people who are, Palestinians are not alone. When people say Palestinians are not, it's not true. Palestinians are not alone. And the stuff that is happening in the US, the US is joining the rest of the world, and more and more, more people are realizing what's going on. 
and the voices are becoming much louder. So I think <laughs> it's really important to keep that in mind and not to leave. It's very depressing, it's very sad, and it's really important to stop and think what does this mean? Or the killing, the murder, and so on. At the same time, also think about the possibilities, all the possibilities, the potential. What can happen when both the people refuse to give up and people around the world refuse to give up on them? So in that sense, the nat narratives of submission, subjugation, and defeat is not actually real. It's the narratives of the people that are actually becoming more well known. And that, you know, we're all here. This is, this is evidence of it. As I, you know, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person who believes in the possibilities of justice and change in the world. Whereas I'm really against this. Okay, and I think this is, I think this is really important for us to keep that in mind. Okay, I know people are being polite and sitting in their seats and so on because we've just seen a film about a massacre. So, but it's 10:10. I'm more than happy to stay until the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but I know people need to get home. So thank you so much.